So uh, thank you very much, Chris, for the invitation and for the, uh, the kind introduction, and, and thank you all for coming. So today I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, ecological research and, and conservation. And as many of you probably know, there's been extensive discussion over the last 10 or 20 years about this perceived mismatch between the kind of conservation biology that most of us read about in journals and write and publish and the kind of actual stuff that's needed for conservation, you know, things that will make a real difference on the ground. And I must admit that personally, you know, I always struggle with the fact that, you know, I think I've done a less good job than I might at translating my field work into making a real difference to the organisms and, and habitats that I, that I care about and I'm trying to protect. But at the same time, I firmly believe there is a place for science, in eco for ecological science in conservation, that we shouldn't do conservation sort of blind to ecological work. And, and so I have this sort of tension between you know, on the one hand, wanting to do good ecological science that will help conservation, but on the other side, a kind of nagging doubt that maybe I'm not really having as good of an impact as I, I might be having. And I sense that I'm not alone in this feeling, and this is a kind of nagging disquiet that's an undercurrent in much of uh, academic conservation biology. At least that's, that's a sense that I get talking with people. So I'm going to talk about that today. I'm going to explore that, that space. So particularly, I'm going to do that by uh, talking first about a sort of broad comparative study that I did looking across uh, the paleotropics, so Africa and Asia, looking at the allocation of research effort and how that might or might not be aligned with what we might actually need for conservation. And then I'll zoom in on Indonesian Borneo, the place where, as Chris mentioned, I've done most of my work, and give some examples of ways where long-term long ecological work, the kind of stuff that most of us are interested in doing, maybe could have positive effects on conservation. So I'll start by reminding you of three really simple things about the tropics that I'm sure you all already know. Uh, the first is that they are highly diverse. Uh, the second is that they are disproportionately threatened with extinction. And the last is that we know much less about tropical species than we do about those in temperate zones. And these bottom two things are, are problems, and they're problems that scientists can help address. Right? The bottom one is easy, right? We reduce our ignorance by learning things, and scientists help us learn things. But most of us like to think also that we can make an effect on, on the middle one, right? That something about the research we do can help inform management and lead to species being uh, less threatened than they currently are. At least that's the hope. But there's also increasing attention to the kinds of more direct benefits that researchers uh, have on conservation. Right? At the sites where they work, field researchers often contribute by you know, training students and, and building capacity among local folks or uh, you know, spreading awareness of environmental issues. Sometimes we help enforce law enforcement, uh, that, that sort of thing. Uh, so there is this growing sense that there are benefits of research stations, but we don't really know much about, uh, it's, it's still kind of airy, you know, we don't, it's not, there's been no real systematic studies of this. So while we think researchers can and, and sometimes do have real positive impacts, we don't really know where researchers work or why. And a couple of colleagues, or three uh, colleagues and I were interested in answering just that really basic question, like where do researchers work uh, and why? And we decided to focus on uh, prote protected areas, terrestrial protected areas in the paleotropics, which are really important places for uh, conservation of biodiversity. So we had this really simple question, where do researchers work and why? And so we did what any normal person would do these days, uh, we Googled it. Right? So uh, quite simply, we went to Google Scholar and we typed in the name of the national park. Right? We used the direct search operator, putting it in quotation marks, and then we hit return, and we got something that you've all seen that looks like this. And this number up here, about X number of searches, uh, we wrote that down for the park. That's data. We interpreted that as data. And we did this for all 565 terrestrial protected areas in all African and Asian countries that house great apes. And we interpret the number of Google Scholar hits as a proxy for research attention to that national park. Right? An imperfect one, but uh, we thought a reasonable proxy for how much attention and time and do researchers spend on these parks and how much do we know about them. And we also had some sort of a priori hypotheses about what might affect this, right? We thought bigger parks might attract more researchers. We thought maybe sites that had been around for a longer period of time uh, attracted more researchers. Maybe sites with higher IUCN protection categories would get more researchers. And we also had this idea that maybe charismatic megafauna attracted researchers. And we know they attack, attract tourists. But do they also attract uh, researchers? So we um, measured the presence and absence of apes in each of these areas. So a really pretty simple study design. 
So here are the, da the raw data. Um, there's huge variation in research attention across these uh, protected areas. More than a third of African national parks return zero hits on Google Scholar. Uh, and as I've said up there, uh, more than half of African national parks had fewer than five hits. The results are less stark in Asia, but similarly uh, highly skewed. Right? So we know almost nothing about almost everywhere. Here's another way to, to look at this. This is just an accumulation diagram uh, plotting these different parks. Uh, in ink. You start on the left, that's the highest number of Google hits, moving to sites on the right that have uh, fewer. And if you look across all of our sites uh, together, the top 17 sites were responsible for 50% of all of the, the 52,000 Google Scholar hits we got across parks. And if you look here at Africa, the top 10% of sites in Africa were responsible for 85% of the Google Scholar hits. And you can see top 20%, 95 Again, the patterns are less stark in Asia, but again, highly skewed. So again, our knowledge is remarkably limited to a very small number of sites. There's also huge variation in research attention across countries. This is a log scale. So these are differences of two, three, four orders of magnitude in the average number of Google Scholar hits per protected area in these different countries, ranked from uh, most to least uh, by, their, um, by their means, I think. So a lot of variation there. I'm not going to spend much time talking about this, but you maybe all have hypotheses in your head right now about what might explain that. And I did too, and the things I thought would matter didn't. So for example, GDP doesn't predict this. Um, whether or not English is their native language does not predict this. But um, it is reasonably well predicted by the World Bank Governance Index and the Democracy Index, which I find sort of in interesting. So a lot of variation across countries as well. We were also interested in knowing what are these papers about. Right? So for a, a random sample of 20% uh, of the protected areas, we downloaded all the papers and used uh, careful measures to assign them to, uh, to particular topics. What taxa were they about? Did they deal with different kinds of issues, et cetera? And I'm just going to show you the data we got on taxa. Right? So we searched all national parks in, in uh, these countries, and we didn't search for anything related to particular taxa being there. Nevertheless, more than 30% of the papers returned were about apes. Almost 24% were about uh, mammals that were not primates, followed by 16% uh, of uh, primates that were not apes. So for one thing, you know, primatologists are disproportionately contributing to our understanding of the tropics, which I found sort of nice to know. Uh, but all told, more than 70% of those papers published are about mammals, right, compared to, say, 11% for plants and 6% for birds. This is a tiny swath of biodiversity, are the mammals, and it's a huge uh, proportion of what's actually published. So there's huge variation in our understanding, and again, massive gaps in the things that we uh, know. So here are the raw data. This scatter plot here lists all of the national parks. I know there's a lot going on there. Uh, things that are triangles are uh, protected areas with no apes. Things that are circles have apes. And symbols that are filled in, uh, our national parks and those that are open are protected areas with other IUCN designations. Lower, formally protected, but with less uh, stringent protections than um, national parks. This just groups uh, the raw hit counts, and you can see that there's an increase here from sites with no apes to those with chimpanzees, those that have chimps and gorillas, those with orangutans, bonobos, uh, and gorillas alone. And then a very stark difference here, national parks get raw many, many more hits than non-national parks. So those are the raw data. As you might imagine, some of these thing co things co-vary. So you want to do this statistically and also control for the fact that the data are horribly skewed, uh, and non-normal. And, and so if you do that and you control for the things uh, that you think should be important and you do model averaging and all the stuff that uh, we know we're supposed to do to, to look at data carefully, uh, you can see the effects of each of these variables controlling for the others. So if you control for park size, and include a random effect for country. And I should say that the year of gazetting had almost no effect. We thought it might have an effect, but it, it didn't drop out of the top models. So if you are a park that has the same size, you are the same IUCN designation, but you have a gorilla in it, you on average get 35 times as many papers published about you than a park that's otherwise the same but doesn't have gorillas. For orangutans, it buys you about four times as many hits. 
uh, and it goes down, chimpanzees are about twice as many hits and bonobos are, are a bit lower. The other thing, if you're a national park, if you control for size, country, whether apes are present or not, if you're a national park, 15 times as many hits. I thought these were really big differences and I didn't necessarily expect them. So just to summarize this first little sort of side study that, that we did, you know, I think most of what we know about the tropics, at least the paleotropics, the terrestrial paleotropics where we work, is about a really small subset of total biodiversity. Right? And it comes from a very small subset of sites, meaning that there are major gaps in our allocation of research effort in the tropics. Second, the sites for which we do have information are atypically large. They are sufficiently well protected and well managed that they contain great apes, and they have higher formal le levels of protection as well, which of course means that our existing knowledge is not only limited, it's also biased, and probably biased towards the places that are doing the best. So I think this could, to the extent that we want to base our conservation and our projections about the future on real data, uh, we might be making dangerously optimistic predictions if we are extrapolating from the places we know. I think there's one final uh, thing that we can draw from this uh, simple study, and I'll do that just focusing on orangutans because it's easier to see it uh, if we throw away a bunch of the African ape data because we don't care about them anyway. So uh, this is the same uh, plot as I showed you before, but just for the Asian sites, again, the basic trends are as before. Uh, many more hits for sites with orangutans than not, and many more hits for national parks uh, than not. And if we just focus on the places where orangutans are found, so get rid of those other data, and then we look at those particular sites and divide it up again, national parks and non-national parks, I think this to me raises some really uh, worrying things. One thing, there's almost no research in small areas, and there's almost no research in uh, non-national parks. So why should we care about this? The future of Borneo, just like much of the rest of the tropics, is forests that are increasingly fragmented. Right? So over time, a greater and greater proportion of the remaining individuals left in the world, individual orangutans, for example, will inhabit smaller and smaller forest gaps. So the orangutan distribution over time is going to get pushed increasingly here and here, right? places where we know almost nothing. And as I've said here, our, the existing knowledge that we have will become less and less useful over time as more and more individuals are inhabiting places that we know very little about. So I think that suggests those of us who want to make positive impacts based on the research that we do are not necessarily working in the right places. We need to be working in other places as well. So just to highlight the importance of this with a couple of uh, facts, fewer than uh, a quarter of Borneo orangutans live inside protected areas. And uh, we can do various simulation models and demonstrate quite clearly uh, that even if we were to protect every orangutan in every protected area in perpetuity, that is an inadequate number of individuals to ensure long-term persistence of the population. Which means, of course, that a big part of the future of orangutan conservation is outside protected areas. In this context, there's been some pretty positive results recently of people going and doing work in modified habitats, places like pulp and paper plantations or uh, moderately logged forests. This was a kind of large uh, uh, analysis of a bunch of different sites where we showed that uh, if you control for the fact that hunting and logging so frequently co-occur, if you control for that statistically, it turns out that logging has very little effects on Borneo orangutan densities, as it does indeed for many uh, rainforest mammals, at least in Borneo but hunting has massive effects. So the implication is we can use these forests, we can selectively log them, and they remain orangutan habitat. And if we are able to do that, 